So welcome, everybody. We understand that you have a choice of places to be at this hour of the morning, considering the weather, and we appreciate that you chose UIC. So, uh, number one, a little bit about the schedule. We'll talk about that. Number two, we will in talk, talk about the importance of narratives for understanding and retention. I will take a few minutes to talk about that, and then we'll actually get into the lecture. So the schedule is real simple. Okay, so for those of you who have joined late and haven't noticed, uh, labs don't start till week three. So don't go to labs this week. Don't go to labs next week. If uh, you have a Monday lab because of Labor Day, there'll be special, you know, set up for that. Don't have to worry about labs right now. Okay, so the schedule, though, we have to do three lectures in five sessions to allow for a review session all right because our exam is at the end of week four so the tuesday of that week the whole session will be a review so we got this thursday we got the next two sessions we got the next two sessions to actually do material so do some quick math figure on about 60 percent of a lecture per session all right so if you want an idea of where we're going to stop where we're going to start you know, what to go over if you miss a day. That's about what we're gonna be following, all right? So that's easy, I hope. Uh, number two, importance of narratives. So one of the things we worry about in academia, where I work, is that students are gonna forget shit as soon as the course is done. And we really don't want that. We would like you to retain some of this as you go out into the world. Now, of course, you're not gonna be as sharp on all these details, you know, two years, three years, five years down the road as you were, you know, the day after the final. Of course, we understand that, but we want you to remember, you know, the big skeleton of all the stuff we're trying to teach and maybe a few details that you found interesting. So let me give an example. Who knows the story of Little Red Riding Hood? And I'd feel comfortable giving a brief uh, synopsis of it. Little Red Riding Hood. Little Red Riding Hood, you know the story? I know you all know the story. They've made movies about it and shit in the last 10 years. Yeah, go for it, what you got? Grandma's sick, yes. Yeah. Keep going, you got it, yeah. Is there a wolf? Yeah, there's a wolf, right? What happens with the wolf? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, well, how does he how does he know to get to the grandma? Can we connect the dots? All right, so you all need a little refresher on Little Red Riding Hood. Previous previous semesters, people, anybody else? Well, how how does the wolf get involved in the story at all? Yeah, he did he did do that, but how does he even get to? Yeah, he meets Little Red Riding Hood, all right? So I'll, I'll give you the fuller synopsis. This is good, okay? Grandma's sick. Mom tells Little Red Riding Hood, hey, you got to take this basket of snacks over to Grandma because she can't feed herself. And you have to go through the dark, scary forest to do it. So stay on the road. You'll be safe, but don't wander off, okay? Little Red Riding Hood, of course, because there's no story without it, she sees some flowers and wanders off. And she wanders off a little more. And she sees a wolf whose defining characteristics are, well, no, it's in his name. He's big and he's bad. So you already know all there is to know about him, right? He's the big bad wolf. So she meets a little bad, big bad wolf and you know, like a lot of predators out there, he pretends to be nice at first. And he's like, oh, hello little girl, what are you doing? Why are you bringing some, you know, what's, what's in the basket? And she says, oh, I'm gonna go see my grandma. She's at the other end of the forest, I'm gonna, whatever. And so the wolf, right, this is not a psychologically normal being that we're dealing with here. This is a total psycho because he could have killed the girl eaten the snacks, gone to grandma, killed the grandma, right? He achieves his goal of getting food, right? He knows that grandma's weak, he can attack her. But instead, he's like, oh, I I'm gonna do you one better. He goes to grandma's house, breaks in, you know, he knocks at the door, pretends to be Little Red Riding Hood, so she lets him in. Then he, you know, kills her and eats her. And then he hides in the bed. It's not like he even has to hide from this little girl. It's not like she's, you know, carrying a chainsaw is gonna fight him off but he dresses like the grandma and hides in the bed. What the hell, right? It's messed up. People tell this story to their kids. 
Anyway, Little Red Riding Hood comes in and says, oh, Grandma, you know, what big eyes you have, you know, what a big head you have, what big teeth you have. And the wolf says, oh, better to eat you with raw, gets it, right? And then depending on the version of the story, you know, the original story, of course, Little Red Riding Hood gets killed and it's, you know, a, a, a warning about listening to your parents and doing what you're supposed to do and not talking to strangers, stuff like that. Or in the milder modern version, you know, there's a friendly woodcutter outside who comes in and chops the wolf open and grandma's still alive and little red riding hood is saved and everybody's happy. Okay. But that's the gist of the story. Now, for me, I tell this, you know, I bring this up like once a semester, actually maybe a couple times a semester because I teach multiple sections of 200. Well, the point is I only got to hear it about every six months or so. I got to hear it twice a year to remember it. Many of you, I'm telling the story. Maybe you haven't heard the story in like 10, 15, 20 years. And you're like, oh yeah, I, I remember it now. It's all coming back together. Okay. So the point of this is not to really discuss Little Red Riding Hood, which is, you know, obviously not central to IDS 200. The point is that people are wired to remember stories. And if you have information that's connected somehow in some kind of continuous thread or some sort of self-reinforcing web, it's a lot easier to remember this stuff. And I'm sure some of you as people were you know, you saw it a little bit. People were talking and saying, oh, I remember this. And it triggers something for somebody else. And they're like, oh, yeah, I remember this other part. Right. And it all kind of comes together. So what I'm saying is if you try to remember, memorize a long list of disjointed, unrelated factoids, it's going to be really tough for humans. Right. Humans don't think that way. Computers think that way. That's fine. But most of you are not robots or robot like, I assume. And it's going to be tougher. So if you come to class and even if you don't come to class, if you listen to the lecture remotely, try to think about this stuff in terms of narratives, in terms of why things are the way they are, and, you know, let the knowledge reinforce itself, right? Because if you forget a little detail, you'd be like, well, it kind of has to be this way because of this other stuff, right? So anyway, that, that's, that's what I'm trying to do here. All right. So anyway, that, that's my bit, and we're going to go in and get started on the lecture. Unless anybody has any questions, concerns, complaints, can complain about the weather, but I'm not the guy to fix that. Nothing? All right. Complain about the, uh, you know, the seating situation, too. You know, obviously, we'd all like to be in, like, a baseball stadium-sized facility, but we're pressed in a little close. It is what it is. Okay. So, photo management, let's do this. I already took one. Oh, I got multiple copies. Okay. Bum, bum, bum. All right. So, here we go. This is the good stuff. So it's 40 lecture, 41 slides. We're going to get to hopefully about 24 and then call it a day. All right. So what we're going to cover, big topics, system scale. Remember, scale just means bigness. Uh, big data as a term and some capacity issues for like, you know, how much capacity you have to do various, you know, IT related tasks. We'll talk about different types of memory, volatile and non-volatile. And we might get a few slides into Facebook's Haystack system. Yeah, that's probably about where we'll end. After that, we'll talk about different kinds of databases. And that'll probably get pushed off till next week. All right. So first of all, durability of Facebook. Facebook's been around almost 20 years, right? It's been around. It's been, you know, dominant during most of that time. There was a brief window. Uh, there were other social media sites like Friendster, like MySpace that gave it, you know, something it had to compete against. But now, kind of as far as social media goes, Facebook is a big thing. And even other things like Instagram, you know, Facebook bought out Instagram. So, yeah, if, you know, you want to go to a place to post some pictures of your vacation and, you know, chat with your grandma, Facebook is kind of the place to do it. So, and like we said, you know, in the intro thing, people stay on Facebook because their friends are on, right? You could go somewhere else, but there's not going to be a lot of people there, so it's not going to be as interesting. But the problem with, uh, you know, even trying to compete against Facebook. Let's do a little thing. So I say here, slowing internet adoption makes it harder for new competitors to thrive, right? This is why Facebook is stable, fundamentally. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna draw a little picture here. We'll put some, you can't see, right? Thank you. By the way, I do this all the time where I switch uh, out of lecture mode and then you guys briefly won't be able to see. And if I take more than a second to remember that that's what's going on and I need to make the screen visible, just shout out screen. Okay, screen, and then I'll know my screen. I got to do. Don't feel weird about it. I had like one student in my summer session that, that was like her full-time job was to shout "screen" like three times a lecture. 
I hope she got paid for it. Okay. So we got a little timeline, right? Now, early on, you had two threads. So we're going to make Facebook here. Facebook comes around, you know, like 2004 or so and starts growing. And who's, who are they up against at the time? We'll use this one for MySpace. Do, you know, it'll be in MySpace green. So MySpace green, you know, as Facebook starts coming in, MySpace starts falling off the chart, right? So the issue here, so I'm going to say green, MySpace, and then Facebook, okay? And this is the number of users. Now, that's Facebook, that's MySpace. Early on, you know, this is the total pool of users, all right? So I'm going to make a, a, another thing here, zoop all users. And for sake of simplicity, I'm just going to pretend it's linear. Okay. All users. Now in 2004, not a lot of people are using social media, which means that even if your app is, you know, pretty good, even if your app, uh, what, what am I saying? Even if there are a lot of other apps out there, if your app is good, people are going to say, oh yeah, this is good. And you can capture a lot of those new people that are joining social media every year. Right. But what happens by the time we're out here, Facebook has pretty much saturated the world, right? As far as, uh, you know, this is still Facebook out here and the world isn't growing that much as far as social media, right? So yeah, there are some people who have not, you know, joined Facebook yet, but honestly, there aren't that many. It's not going to be possible for some new competitor to come in and say, oh, I don't really have to compete directly against Facebook. I just have to provide a better experience and I'll capture a lot of the new growth. Right, that's no longer a thing. Anybody wants to beat Facebook now, they actually have to take users from Facebook in order to get big enough to prosper. Remember we had this whole thing about economies of scale? Yeah, so this is why it's kind of not happening. Like I said, there are challenges. YouTube was a challenge for Facebook. If you view social media, not just as uh, its own thing, but just as a flavor of entertainment, and you could choose to do social media or watch videos or uh, play video games, whatever, which it also kind of is. And Facebook is vulnerable to competition from that, right? There's a, uh, a widespread feeling that Facebook activity is kind of toxic for a variety of reasons. And people are like, ooh, I, I don't want to go on there too much. And so they end up watching videos on TikTok. Sure, that's going to cut into Facebook's business, right? But that's not going to drive Facebook out of the social media business. It's just going to mean that social media is less important than it used to be. All right, so that's a little background there. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Yeah, okay, good. I got the thumbs up from the front row. That was good. Okay, now having said like all that, Facebook isn't invulnerable. If something goes really wrong, because they've had some major data breaches, I mean, it hasn't been to the point of everybody's account getting hacked on the same day. You know, that would obviously be very bad. But if there were major issues with privacy or security, system performance, like pages start loading really slow, all that could cause mass defections, right? People could go to whatever the you know next best social media site is. What we're really seeing right now is people starting to get tired of social media generally, and they're doing other stuff though. So we'll see what happens. And if you're interesting, uh, and if you're interested, little link there about some issues. Uh, Apple is now putting in uh, new rules about privacy, making it a little bit harder for Facebook to target ads to people, make money off them. Uh, different countries, you know, are also having uh, you know, more privacy regulation. So that's kind of cutting into Facebook's business model too. Anyway, so because of this, because Facebook is big and they want to keep growing and they still do have some challenges, even though they're pretty entrenched in their part of the, you know, internet, they still need to do some kind of continuous innovation for managing their systems. Uh, and the big thing is, you know, scale. Because even if they're not getting that many new users every year, what's still happening is those users are still adding on a lot of content every year that has to be managed. Okay, so as you might know, Facebook is the world's biggest social media application, right? And it's insane, it has 3 billion monthly users out of a global population of close to 8 billion, right? So that, that's kind of crazy. A lot of people there on Facebook. So yeah, and about 2 billion daily users. So people showing up every day to do stuff. And I think most of them are probably real humans, not bots, although it's hard to know. But yeah, probably most of them are actual humans. Uh, rough number, this is, it's probably a little bigger now. It's hard to get uh, current data on this. When I was like searching for daily photo uploads on Facebook, 
I kept seeing figures from 2013. It was, yeah, but daily uploads, the best, most recent numbers I see are at least 350 million a day. It's probably a little more, but we say at least that. And their annual ad revenue last year, 115 billion. Now, let me mention, before we get all into this, even though I'm bringing this stuff up as background, all these little factoids about Facebook, they're not really testable, okay? You should have an idea that, yeah, Facebook's big, Facebook's social media, I shouldn't have to explain that. I'm just giving a little background to introduce, you know, the company. But where this becomes relevant, Facebook is really big. So activities that are easy for a smaller organization to do or can be achieved with ordinary off-the-shelf software and systems, Facebook just can't do. Facebook's too big. Uh, for example, uh, small versus large data batches in Excel. Anybody know a ballpark number about how many rows you can have in a single Excel worksheet? Time for some Excel trivia? Nothing? More than 100. More than 500. Morning. Morning. What was that? Well, we got two Misfits t-shirts here today. That's kind of wacky. Anyway, you guys. Anyway. Did you go see them? Did they come around again? Cool. I couldn't remember. I knew, I knew that Danzig was back with them, but I didn't know that. Yeah, that's awesome. Anyway, they were big when I was a kid. Anyway, uh, fans never die anymore. You know, this, this is like the joke. I remember some of the first farewell tours shit when the Who did their thing like 19 years. Oh, this is our farewell tour. And then they like lurch on for 20 years. Rolling Stones did a farewell tour in the 80s, and then they're, they're still alive somehow. Yeah, Slayer. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, all right. Anyway, find, uh, Excel, back to Excel. Million rows, right? Basically, I mean, it's a little bit more precise number. It's like 2 to the 20th, but very close to a million rows in an Excel document. But if you're Facebook and you want to create an Excel document, you know, with one row for each user, you can't do that in one worksheet, right? Three billion users, you need 3,000 worksheets to do that. And that only includes the current ones, not like the old out of date ones. And that's gonna be super slow. If you've ever tried working data with a you know regular Excel and it's a big worksheet, it takes a second. Imagine like doing those updates on 3,000 sheets. So my point is, you wanna manage any of that at that scale, ordinary off the shelf software is not gonna work. You gotta design your own stuff, right? You have to do custom stuff to deal with that scalability problem. Same thing for finding files. The big things Facebook does is allow people to upload files and then retrieve them. But guess what? Same thing, difficult. If you've ever tried to locate a file on your machine and it's an older machine where you know, you've know you got like untold tens of thousands of files on there and you just use the regular file search utility to try to find it, it's gonna take a while, right? The wheels are gonna spin for a few minutes. That's not gonna be okay if you're Facebook and you're dealing with 350 million pictures and people constantly requesting them in order to look at pictures and you know receive their feeds, stuff like that. So again, they need custom systems. Stuff that's easy when you're small becomes a big challenge when you're big. All right. Now, a little bit of these, you know, trivia here. You should know these. You know, these will be mentioned on the exam. Uh, your basic scale measures. So the first four you should all know because those are everyday usage, right? Kilo is for a thousand, and kilo a thousand bytes, a kilobyte is about a short text file, right? So a thousand letters, so you know, like 25 lines of uh, 40 characters, that's a thousand, okay? Or it could be like only 500 because now a lot of character sets are two bytes per character, but still. Next one, a meg mega, right? Mega stands for a million. All these are increasing by a thousand. So one megabyte, thousand kilobytes, and a million bytes is a pretty big image, right? So if we're saying something like uh, four bytes per pixel, then you can have 250,000 pixels, which, what's the square root of 250,000? 5,000, is that right? No, that can't be right, more than 5,000. So like 12, six, about 16,000, I think. Math is hard, 1,600? Yeah, 16, ah, shit, I don't know. Anyway, it's a lot, okay? You can do the math, but I'm, you know, I, I just woke up. Anyway, it's a big image. Not super big, not super high res, right? I mean, those could easily be like 10 megs, but you get the idea. Uh, a gigabyte, billion, a long video, right? So back in the day, you had regular CDs. Regular CDs could hold 665 megabytes, so close to a gigabyte. DVDs carried, not surprisingly, 
twice as much, right? The D for double. Uh, so they carry about 1.3 gigs. So, you know, if you get a movie and it's on one DVD, yeah, it could be about, about a gigabyte. Terabytes uh, is a typical size for hard drives, for hard disks. And uh, you buy a machine these days, right? You might get something bigger than one terabyte, but one terabyte's a pretty common size. So that's, that's about how big that is. Now, the three we get beyond that, those are like industry ones. Things are getting started to get big. So a petabyte, it's pronounced PETA, not PETA like the organization, it's PETA. Petabyte is about one day's worth of Facebook's new data for images. So if you look up, you know, how many images Facebook is getting and you multiply that by a typical guess about how much data is in each of those images, it becomes about a petabyte. And that's a thousand terabytes. So if you think about that for a second, every day Facebook is getting a thousand hard drives worth of new data. And that doesn't even include backup copies, right? So it might be like three truckloads of hard drives every day come into Facebook uh, just to keep up with their data upload rate. An exabyte is a thousand petabytes, or if you like, something like a million hard drives. That's a lot of data, right? A very large organization, organization that keeps a lot of data, like Google, like Facebook, like Amazon, they're gonna have several exabytes of data, right? They don't come out and say, you know, we have 10 exabytes of data, but you know they're gonna have a bunch. All right, and zettabytes, a thousand exabytes. Uh, it was just a few years ago, it was around 2017 that the total amount of internet traffic in a year hit the zettabyte mark. Now it's something in the ballpark of like four or five zettabytes, last I checked. And it's keeping on growing, of course. You know, a lot of that streaming video in uh, higher quality. So, you know, that, that's really where a lot of the growth was. Anyway, you should know all those if you like. You can think up some, you know, again, everybody should know the first four, right? You should all know what those are because those are fairly everyday things that people use. Uh, the other three, I don't know, Pez, right? You guys know what Pez dispensers are? Pez. That's all I can tell you if you want to know the sequence there. Okay, so you should know what those are. Now, next thing, big data. Probably some of you have heard the term big data. Maybe you heard it a long time ago because people probably don't say big data that much anymore, which is good. Big data hasn't gone away. It's just that everything is kind of big data now, and so there's not much point talking about it. So what big data means in uh, you know casual usage is some amount of data that's difficult for uh, regular, ordinary software systems to handle, right? You require something special to deal with it. At that point, it goes just from being ordinary data to being big data. Uh, and it can happen in a bunch of different ways. So there's the so-called four Vs, volume, if you just have a lot of data. For example, you know, if you have more data than you can easily store on one hard drive, you need multiple hard drives and you have to find some way to efficiently search whether things are on one, way, one hard drive or the other, right? That's a basic thing. Uh, velocity, how fast data is coming in, right? You might have abundant storage capacity, but you're not able to deal with how many people are uploading photos or how many people are requesting photos, right? So your uh, processing capacity might in some sense be a bottleneck. Variety, as we'll talk about in, uh, in terms of databases in a little bit, if you have a lot of different kinds of data, it can be difficult to handle. For example, in terms of photos, if you have a bunch of little photos and a bunch of big photos, that itself is gonna require some kind of special handling that we'll see in a minute. And last, veracity. Anybody know what veracity means? Who took Latin in high school? Nobody took Latin? When I was in high school, we had a Latin teacher. She had one eye. That's no joke. She had like one eye and one glass eye. And because uh, kids are kids are assholes. Every now and then somebody would like throw a paper player, paper airplane out of her to, you know, watch her flinch because she didn't have good depth perception. So yeah. Veracity comes from the Latin for truth. Okay, so veracity basically means verifying that, you know, your, uh, your data is correct. And the more data you have, if you have multiple copies of it, it becomes more work to cross check everything in every copy to verify that everything is actually correct. All right, so, and there's a little picture that covers those four, that's fine. All right, don't get too hung up on the four Bs. I don't really, you know, you don't really need to memorize them, but you know, understand that those are like typical issues, but we'll, we'll have more to say about them later. Now, problem with saying big data, you shouldn't say big data, 
right? If you, if you go out and start talking about big data problems at job interviews and such, you know, they're going to be like big data. Who talks about big data? What is this? 2008, you know? So don't, I mean, if one of your interviewers talks about big data and says, what do you know about big data? Then yeah, you, you can talk then. Don't be like, Oh, we never say big data in Matt. UIC, we don't we don't say big data, right? Don't don't be that guy. But anyway, yeah, people are getting away from saying it then. Uh, problem is it's an inherently imprecise and technology dependent term. For example, a big data problem for UIC is going to be trivial for Facebook, right? I mean, UIC, sure, they manage a lot of data, but nothing like what Facebook has to deal with. Uh, and big for 2000 is shit, typo there is trivial for 2020, not 2000. I don't know how these things sneak in. Okay, for example, screen, thank you. But we're just going straight back to the lecture. Somebody break a light bulb? Oh, that was scary. Okay, so way back in the 80s, I knew a guy who was a computer guy, and <clears throat> I, I'm gonna say it, he was very excited toward the end of the 80s to get a one megabyte external disk drive. One megabyte was huge. We had these little floppy disks back in the day, the five and a quarter ones. They could uh, be good for holding 45K on one side or 90K on another. So not only was it gonna be like 10 or 20 floppies in one shot, it was gonna be blindingly fast by comparison. And we were all like, whoa, you got so much data. It's gonna be so fast. What are you gonna do with that? I don't know what he did with that. I didn't really hang out with him that much. He was a weird guy. But my point is, right, one, one megabyte, that's nothing now, right? That's nothing. You go down to Office Depot and buy like some 64 gig uh, USB drive now for 10 bucks, right? And it's going to be faster than that disk drive was. Uh, when I first moved to Chicago a little bit before 2000, I was very excited. I got a new desktop running Windows XP. Anybody want to guess what the hard drive was? How many gigs? Six. Oh, wait, so you see it better. Six. six gigs. And not only was six gigs unthinkably huge in terms of memory, I never even filled up that thing. I had that machine for like five years, and I only ever got it to like three gigs full. Right? It's not like it is now. You know, data just piles up now. But, yeah, back, you know, even 20 years ago, a few gigs was a lot of data for a lot of people. So anyway, perspective, if you want to read an article here, uh, a guy talking about big data as a concept will be pretty much dead in five years because of the fact that all organizations, they're doing so much in terms of analytics that kind of everything they do is going to be a big data problem. And at the point when everything is a big data problem, then everybody just kind of shrugs and says, well, that, that's just data now. That's just the way data is. And they're not going to be managing it themselves. They're going to be managing it in the cloud. And so it'll be somebody else's problem. So... Anyway, and he's probably right. That seems, that seems about right to me. All right, so the next thing we're gonna talk a little bit about photo processing. We're gonna talk about how Facebook does some of that and how it relates to capacity. So if you've ever put a face, uh, uploaded a photo to Facebook, you know that it's a mildly complex multi-step process, right? I mean, there's some stuff that we see on our side, but there's also a bunch of stuff behind the scenes that happens. So, when you upload a photo to Facebook, first thing that's going to happen, Facebook accepts the upload, right? So, you know, they have to somehow process that file that uh, you sent up there. Then they're going to scan it. They're going to scan it and say, well, is this the kind of photo that we feel comfortable allowing people to see on Facebook, right? So that's going to take a minute. If it passes that test, Facebook is going to store it somewhere. It's going to make a record of where it's stored. It's going to make backup copies of it somewhere in case something goes wrong, right? One of their data centers gets hit by lightning or something. It's going to make backup copies and then it's also going to distribute it to other users. So as soon as you post that photo and they've cleared it to be, you know, distributed through the network, your friends are going to start seeing it. They're going to say, oh, you just posted this nice photo of your vacation. Right. And being able to execute those steps quickly at scale is an example of an important competitive advantage for Facebook. Right. If some other social media site comes along they're going to have to set up a whole system that does all of this stuff at least as fast as Facebook, faster than Facebook, in order to successfully compete against Facebook, right? And that's not a cheap or trivial thing to do. Not something that you and three of your buddies are going to put together in dad's garage over the weekend. Okay. Now, 
here we get into the capacity side of things, right? So there's a certain amount of work that Facebook has to do to make all those steps happen. And that work is going to take a certain amount of time. So Facebook has to have enough capacity available to match the supply and demand for aggregate user actions. Basically for all the people in any time interval that want to upload photos, Facebook has to have enough system resources available to process those uploads, right? Otherwise, what's going to happen? There's going to be some kind of backlog, right? People are going to have to wait. Uh, the line's going to get long, like at the DMV, and people are going to say, this sucks, you know, I'm leaving Facebook forever. So demand is the side, right? Demand for use of the system. How many people want to upload photos? And that can be influenced, right? Facebook can do various things to encourage uploads during the day. They can do that but they have certainly very limited control. If there's just a bunch of people in the morning that want to upload photos, yeah, Facebook's kind of got to deal with that. Uh, if you're doing stuff like actual throttling, if you're saying like, nope, we're not going to let you upload too many photos during this time stretch. I mean, I'm sure there is some upper bound on how many photos you can upload in a time interval to Facebook. Most of us never come anywhere close to hitting that, right? But if, if they did some throttling, say, oh, you've already uploaded five photos this hour. Sorry, you got to wait till next hour you know, people are going to be unhappy. So Facebook, you know, they got to deal pretty much with whatever demand is. Supply, on the other hand, supply is Facebook's ability to process those uploads. And the system capacity depends, number one, on hardware, how fast the hardware can do what it's supposed to do, right? So how fast the network is, how fast it can access the disk drives, how fast the, you know, disk drives can send out data to other parts of the system, all that, and process design. Right, process may design may be designed more or less efficiently. You may uh, outsource some of this to third parties that are faster than you. We'll see some of this that Facebook actually did. But at some point, if you've gotten the system to run about as efficiently as you can, right, with whatever resources you have and the process as optimized as it can be, if you want to add capacity at that point, it's going to cost more money, right? You're going to either have to upgrade components or you're going to have to add more components to work in parallel. Okay, so that, that's the basic capacity problem. Now, this is about as math as this course gets. I have an equation that you should understand, but you'll never have to do any math on it. Okay, but there is an equation there, so don't be scared. Uh, over time, Facebook's ability to process photos has to match the upload rate, right? Basically, supply has to match demand. Now, if you're going to write an equation for that, we'd use some standard terms. So that funny looking letter there, is actually a lowercase green L or lambda, right? It looks like a line with a tail. I don't know. It looks like a, like a, I don't know, a pigeon foot missing a toe. I don't know. Uh, that's a lambda. Lambda is a commonly used thing for what's called an arrival rate, how many things happen per unit time. And lambda is going to equal S over T sub P. S is the number of system processors. T sub P is the time to process each photo. So, if the upload rate increases, if lambda increases, then one of two things has to happen to make that equation remain valid. Either S has to increase at the same rate, right? So if the arrival rate increases, Facebook could add more computers in parallel to process more photos faster, right? Twice as many users uh, uploading photos, great. Facebook adds twice as many machines and it can keep up. Or it can make the process more efficient, right? by having less time per photo. So if T sub P goes down, then that quotient there, S divided by T sub P, that quotient also gets bigger, right? Because again, if the processing time goes down, Facebook can process more photos per second. Now, so again, if the upload rate increases, one thing is you can add more system processors to do it, or number two, you can make your process faster, or three, there's gonna be a backlog. And if there's a backlog, that means people are going to have to wait. And if people have to wait, nobody's ever really happy about waiting. So they don't want people to wait. All right. Now, basic uh, idea of Facebook solution. You know, this is obviously very, very simple because this is like the first week of IDS 200. Uh, they have this massive system that combines RAM and permanent storage, right? So some things are going to be stored on RAM, which is fast. Some things are going to be stored on disk which is slow, but cheap, All right? That's, that's the trade-off. And they also do what's called caching. Caching means making some data easier to access. So in general, they're going to cache some photos in RAM, typically the more popular ones, 
in order to make those easier to reach so that they can deliver them out faster. Basically with whatever pile of system resources they have, they can process more requests per second because the most popular ones are cached in this very, very fast part of the system. And they're gonna do replication, right? Again, replication, uh, you have multiple copies of anything throughout your system, maybe at one data center, maybe at different data centers for a variety of reasons, you know, you might pick one or the other. But the big reason why you do replication is so that if you lose a copy, right, if the hard drive, you know, gets a defect and lose all the data on it, you don't actually lose all the data within your organization. You have another copy of it somewhere. Okay, now their system, Haystack, you know, derives from the idea of finding a needle in a haystack, that, you know, finding one photo, considering how many photos Facebook has, finding a single particular photo is like finding a needle in a haystack. I have a couple articles about that, you know, from back in the day, if you want to look at it, it's interesting stuff. Uh, if you want to wait till I talk about Haystack and then go back and take a peek at these, that would be uh, a valid approach as well. You can really understand Facebook solution. We got to talk more about memory and databases. Okay, so we got to do that little bit of background before we can talk about what Haystack is, why it's important, how it worked well. We'll talk about the components a little bit first. Oh no, they invented it. Yeah, circa 2009, that was their thing. So all that stuff when I say that, you know, they need custom systems, Haystack is one of their big custom systems. Yeah. Okay, so there's two different kinds of memory types, but there's a lot of different ways to look at two different kinds of memory types, right? You can branch it off in different ways. So one way to branch it off, which I've done here in this image, is some memory, you can only look at what's there. You can only read it. You can't change what the memory stores, okay? That's called read-only memory or ROM, R-O-M, read-only memory, right? ROM memory basically comes in some sort of basically permanent unit that ordinary users like you and me can't change. Now, sure, if you have like advanced electronics equipment, and maybe a couple degrees in knowing what you're doing, yeah, you could you could change that stuff if you really know what you're doing. But ordinary users, yeah, they're not going to be able to change that. We're, you know, if you get a bunch of ROM chips, what's there is there. You can't mess with that. Okay. The other kind is read and write memory. Read, again, means you can look at what's there. Write means you can change what's there. You can overwrite what's in memory. But it's just shorter to say write, so people do. So those are your two kinds. One is memory you can change. One is memory you can't change. Within memory you can change, there are two kinds, volatile and non-volatile. So volatile memory means when the power goes away, the memory contents vanish, right? And you've all experienced this in machines where the power goes away, your battery fails, and suddenly, bloop, you lose everything that you were working on, right? That's, yeah, that's RAM. That's pretty standard for most kinds of RAM. The other is non-volatile. Non-volatile is permanent memory right? It lasts even when the power goes off, right? So if you have some ancient laptop that's been like sitting in your closet for six years and you pull it out and you start it up and, you know, there's a little puff of smoke, but it does start working. What's there on the hard drive is still there, right? Even if the CMOS chip that uh, controls like the date and time, even if that's run out of power, the contents, so, you know, you might open up your laptop and it says it's like 2014 or something, right? Because, yeah. But, the, uh, the contents of the hard drive will still be there because it's permanent. Uh, memory is another kind, those little USB drives. Uh, it occurs in other places too. A lot of uh, tablets, other devices use it as well. Uh, also non-volatile, right? It doesn't go away when the power goes away. Okay, so we'll talk about those in a moment, but uh, another thing, different access models. So there's three ways you can read from memory, or for that matter, you can write to memory. And the three are sequential access, direct access, random access. So sequential access, the best way I can describe it in everyday terms for you now is watching something on Netflix, right? If you're watching something on Netflix and you want to, you're, it's at the start of the movie and you want to watch the end of the movie, what do you have to do? You got to fast forward through it, right? It's going to take a little while. That's sequential access memory, right? You can't instantly bounce around from one part of the memory sequence to another. You have to go through sequential. 
So back in the day, a lot of memory was sequential like this. Uh, you had things called tape drives. Tape drives were basically the hard drives of the 80s and 90s. They were really slow, but they were cheap. You could hold an absurd amount of memory uh, in those days on a tape drive, you know, more, more than what people need. Now, these days, sequential access memory is pretty uncommon as far as hardware. Like I said, you guys experience it when you're watching streaming videos. Uh, it takes a little while to get to that. You know, you got to fast forward through stuff. But other than that, it's pretty uncommon. Uh, one of the few surviving examples, tape drives for extreme conditions, right? If you're some uh, mountaineering group or, uh, you know, extreme altitude, military, special forces type operation, you might use a tape drive just because it's really, really rugged. I mean, you guys know that if you got a hard drive, an old timey hard drive, and you bump it a little bit, it's probably kind of lost. Tape drives can take a real beating and still, you know, be viable. So, yeah, tape drives for extreme conditions, that, that's a thing. Uh, so, sequential access memory, the important thing to take away from that, number one, you don't really see it much anymore, and number two, it kind of sucks and you'd rather use about anything else, okay? Second one is direct access storage. Direct access storage is a mix of what's called sequential, indexed, and direct access. So sequential, we've already talked about. Indexed and direct access, well, the indexing works like a bunch of tracks on a vinyl record. You guys have a, an idea of how a vinyl record works, right? There's like this round thing with uh, grooves in it, and you put the stylus on the grooves and it makes music. Yeah, that's the indexing, right? So imagine you have a record that has six songs on it, and you want to listen to song two. What do you do? You don't have to play all the way through song one, right? What do you do? In some sense, you pick up a needle and move it over and drop it at the start of track two, right? And maybe your system automatically does that because it's smart, or maybe you got to do it by hand. But point is, you don't have to go sequentially through everything. That's the indexed part. So you can find what's somewhere, if you know what's there, you know, you look at the track listing and then you can move the needle to the approximate place. But once you get to that track, if you want to hear a specific part of that track, if you say, wow, I really like this uh, guitar solo in, you know, like three minutes into the song and I want to hear that again, you kind of got to listen through the whole thing or a chunk of it, right? It's hard to drop that needle precisely three minutes in. That's the same thing with hard drives, right? So this is the way hard drives work. There's a disc that spins around, this is a literal disc, and it's got what are called tracks, same thing, right? These long sequential spirals of data but each track has a list of what contents it has. And if you want to find a particular file, you don't go immediately to that point. You say, oh, I know the file is somewhere in this track and I spool around the hard drive until I find it. So it's better than sequential access. You don't have to go through the whole thing to find what you're looking for, but you know, it's still slower than, it, uh, than you'd really like to be. So hard drives used it, uh, CD, DVD drives used it, but those are all pretty obsolete. Uh, Many USB drives, many solid state drives also use that, also use that model. Not all of them. There's different kinds of uh, memory that those have. Again, though, this isn't uh, computer engineering, so we don't need to get too deep into that. But just be aware, direct access storage devices, they still exist. They're not that fast, but, you know, definitely they're, they're faster than sequential access. And the last one, random access memory, right? Random access memory is typically all electronic. You know, I guess in principle you have mechanical random access memory, but nobody really does, but I guess you could maybe. Uh, kind of, probably not. Uh, data, the magic thing about RAM, why it's called random access, okay? Sequential access, direct access, if you access the data, if you read the data in a particular sequence, it's gonna be faster than if you access it in another sequence, right? So. If you're trying to pull an entire file that's sequential in a stat in a, in a track, that's a lot faster than pulling the same amount of data from weird random locations scattered throughout the hard drive, right? Because every time you're pulling something, you got to move that needle to where it wants to go. And that takes time because it's a mechanical device. Random access memory doesn't matter where the memory contents are stored. It's going to be, you know, about exactly the same time regardless. So you don't have to access memory sequentially. And that's what makes it really good for running applications because applications tend to have data stored in all sorts of random places. You'll have like one block of memory reserved for one part of the application, another block for something else. If you're trying to do that on a disk, you know, the thing's going to be spinning around all day. But in RAM, 
it's really fast. The other thing is because it's electronic, it's going to be super fast compared to any mechanical system, right? There's no way a mechanical system is going to be faster than little electrons bouncing around in the system. So you can access things in about the same time, regardless of where it's stored. It's super fast compared to disk drives, but in general, RAM is also much more expensive than disk drives. And where you see it, of course, main memory on your machine. So like if you go, uh, you know, buy some laptop or something that says, you know, this has 32 gigs of RAM. Well, that's the main memory for your machine. That's where the applications are gonna run. Uh, some USB storage devices, some solid state drives also use random access memory, but their RAM is not gonna be as fast as ordinary main memory RAM. Yeah, oh, no, I saw a hand, it wasn't a question. Okay. So as far as non-volatile memory, remember volatile means memory goes away when the power goes away. Different types of non-volatile memory. Number one, your standard read-only memory, ROM, can't change it, can't change what's in there. And the big example there is hardware chipsets, right? If you have some, uh, some set of chips that already have a bunch of stuff hardwired onto it, like you buy a graphics card that has a bunch of chips for how the graphics card is gonna work, you can't go in there and alter those, that, that's a ROM. Uh, also DVD ROMs, CD ROMs, if they're not magnetic, right? If they're actually burned with a laser, you need super specialized equipment to undo that or change it in any way, right? But if it is magnetic, then it's not really read only. The other one, flash memory, right? So USB drives use what's called flash memory, non-volatile random access memory. So when I say, you know, NVRAM, yeah, it's, it's, it's a kind of RAM, but it's not the same kind of RAM as this other. Uh, it's going to be very slow for, for performing computations, but a, lo a lot of cases it's fast enough for uh, sequential storage and retrieval. So anyway, don't need to dig too much into flash memory. Again, just flash memory isn't volatile, right? And also uh, known as NVRAM, non-volatile RAM. And where you see it, again, some USB drives, some solid state drives use that. Okay. Now, there's really two types of RAM. Dynamic RAM is like the first generation version of what eventually became synchronous RAM. But I, I mean, they are, they are distinct. I'm gonna talk about some hardware here, so brace yourself. Again, this is not a computer engineering class, so I'm gonna try to give you some stories on why things are called the way they are that maybe help it stick a little bit. But again, this isn't a computer engineering course, so you don't super need to know how RAM works, but it may help you recall how it does. So dynamic RAM is just, you know, it was like the first generation of RAM, really. It was uh, random access, it was electronic, it was memory, it was pretty fast in its day. It was around in the 70s, it uh, was created, you know, they kept making it a little bit better, uh, working a little bit differently, but it was widely used until the end of the 90s. So it had a pretty long life within, you know, the computer universe. But eventually it got replaced by something called synchronous RAM. Now, synchronous RAM or SD RAM, the neat thing about that, it used some kind of outside clock to control the signal arrival. So let me explain a little bit how that works. What you have in memory is basically a batch of eight circuits in every byte that either hold ones or zeros. Okay, so zero or one. And you have eight of them. Thank you. Now, in dynamic RAM, there would be some sort of scheduled time where every so often there would be a pulse of information from the outside world to hit those things, right? But the thing is, it would all be like eight signals applying, arriving separately. So the issue became, how do you make sure that these signals are arriving at approximately the same time. Because if you can control that all these signals are arriving at the same time and you know that either there was a signal or there wasn't, if you can have that happen at shorter and shorter intervals, you can process more instructions, more changes to that memory per unit time. That kind of makes sense? If you're saying, oh yeah, I, if you say, I know that there's gonna be a signal within the next 10 milliseconds, then that means you can process one operation about every 10 milliseconds. If you know that the signal has to arrive within 10 microseconds, then you know that, well, either it arrived or it didn't, you can process things a thousand times faster, right? Because microseconds instead of milliseconds. 
So that's the idea with synchronous RAM. It tries to coordinate all of those uh, impulses hitting the memory so they happen at the same time so it can control, you know, so it can process more instructions per second so it's faster. Okay, so that's what synchronous RAM is. That's why it's called synchronous RAM. Uh, and when you see it sold, you'll see it sold as DDR levels, right? So the current uh, generation DDR5, every level means it's twice as fast as the previous uh, generation. So the original generation SD RAM, it was replaced by DDR2 or just DDR for double data rate. It was replaced by DDR, which was double the rate of the original one. DDR2 was twice as fast as DDR, DDR5 twice as fast as DDR4, right? So every time you see that DDR in the synchronous dynamic RAM, you say, wow, twice as fast as it used to be. Good job, guys. Good job, engineers. Okay. Uh, and there's a link if you want to read more. Static RAM, on the other hand, static RAM is kind of different. Uh, so number one, it's faster. It consumes less power. Thus, it tends to generate less heat. You need less cooling. It's kind of easier to work with. It's a lot faster, even than really fast synchronous dynamic RAM. And where it's commonly used is with uh, CPU caches. So if you're buying a machine and it says it has, you know, like a 256K, 256 meg, uh, you know, L1 cache, that means that there's memory associated with that CPU. It's right there. It's basically welded onto it. It's going to run super, super fast. Like if you're doing some little loop through memory to do some math, something like that, it's going to be super fast. Now, the numbers I get for this, they're a little out of date. Uh, I did have an article. I guess it's a little further in the slides. I'm going to bring this up here, though, just to. Maybe I pulled it. Pull it. I didn't make uh, some. Tea. Yeah, OK. So there was an old uh, article by an unfortunately named fellow called Jay Boner. Uh, was, yeah, latency. See, it's still I can even. Yeah. yeah thank you. OK. So this, if, if you're looking at this, just to give an idea of how much faster some of these things are, and again, these, these numbers are kind of old, right? It's like 10 years old, but relatively speaking, you know, relative to each other, they're about the same. So if you're doing an L1 cache reference, that's some static RAM, half a nanosecond to look something up. That's insane, right? Half a nanosecond. If you're doing something in main memory, like ordinary uh, SD RAM, 100 nanoseconds. So still really fast, but static RAM's way, way, way faster. Now, the trick about static RAM is it also physically takes up more space per unit of memory than SD RAM. So when you have this uh, static RAM, it only works well in tiny, tiny, tiny chunks because if you have big chunks of it, then the speed savings you get from it being inherently faster are lost because the electrons have to travel further within the memory to do what they're going to do, right? So static RAM, this is why you don't use static RAM for the main memory of your device, because at that scale, it wouldn't be faster than regular SD RAM. Okay. Anyway, so that's all, like I said, that's a little computer science-y, but yeah. Okay. So that's it. So know that, you know, know the three different types of RAM. Like I said, DRAM, it's obsolete. You won't see it anymore. It was nice to have it back in the day, but it's gone now. SD RAM, that's your ordinary main memory RAM. It's really fast. You know, know what DDR levels are. Static RAM, really, really, really fast, but only in tiny chunks. Okay? All right. Now, next thing, RAID. So, RAID devices are still used. What a RAID device is, is basically a bunch of hard drives or a bunch of disks inside a single application housing. So for the outside user, it feels like you're using one machine, but there's actually a bunch of separate disks in there. And RAID devices are still used. They still have them for solid state drives. Uh, but where it's actually really useful is as an introduction to cloud. So what, you know, tuck all this stuff away in the back of your head. When we do get to cloud, you'll be like, oh yeah, that is kind of like cloud. You have a bunch of different operating units hidden behind the same interface. Right, it's, it's conceptually, it's not that different. So uh, there's different models for RAID that allow emphasizing factors like write speed, like read speed, reliability. So we'll talk about this. All right, the three basic RAID techniques, striping, mirroring, and parity. 
So striping is pretty easy to understand. What that means, if you have a big file that you would normally have to store on a single hard disk because you only have one hard disk, with striping, you can break up that file into chunks, store each chunk on a different disk, and down, read and write them much faster, and I'll explain why. Okay, so imagine we have this uh, RAID device, and we'll keep it super simple. We're just going to give it, thank you. We're just going to give it uh, two disks for now. And I'm going to mention that there's some kind of electronic interface. So, like, I'm going to label these disks one and two. Okay. And there's going to be some kind of electric uh, electronic interface here. And this is super fast relative to the, the disk. So I'm going to say interface very fast compared to the disk speed. Okay, so what that means is, yeah, even though you're, uh, if, if you're doing striping, half of the file, half file stored on one, other half on two, read or write the whole thing in half the time, right? Because you've got two disks doing stuff in parallel. Somewhere at the interface, there's a chunk of memory that's going to, you know, store what's there. The network connection to that device is going to be really fast. The real time limiting factor is spinning around on the disks, is reading stuff on the disk. The other stuff is super fast. Okay? So if you do striping, right, striping on X disks multiplies speed and writes by X. Easy to understand, I hope. Yeah? Okay, so th that's striping. Downside, if one disk fails, you lose everything. Okay? That's, that's a big downside, right? So if there's a defect on either disk where the disk becomes unusable, yeah, you don't, you know, you lose access to that. So it uh, creates reliability problems. The other thing, more advanced downside, is this, uh, splitting and rejoining the file does add a little bit more work to the system, okay? And where that's important, if your RAID device is really busy, you know, this is actually gonna be maybe a bit slower overall. You're gonna be able to pr process less operations per unit time. So any given operation is gonna be faster, but your system as a whole is gonna be slower. It's kind of this weird thing. Uh, because again, because you're adding more, uh, more work into the system. There's additional requirements. You have a file come in, the interface has to split it, has to put it back together. If your device isn't busy, then that interface stuff is gonna be a rounding error compared to how much faster the stuff is gonna be. But if you have a long, continuous set of tasks to do, then it is gonna be a little bit slower. It's kind of a, a weird thing. But again, that, that's kind of an advanced uh, downside. So slower for very busy systems. Okay. Uh, the next thing is mirroring. Fortunately, mirroring is also very easy to understand. I'll use green for mirroring. Mirroring means making multiple copies on separate disks, right? So one file means one copy on one and another on two. Obviously, this adds more work to the system. And just like we were talking about a minute ago with striping, if your system isn't really busy, then that's not going to matter, right? It's going to take about the same time because you're doing that in parallel. Both disks are working separately. But again, slower for very busy systems, because why? Because you are inc increasing the amount of work that has to be done, right? Each disk drive is having to work all the time. So yeah, you're more likely to get backlogs and such. But advantage, massive reliability increase. Right, so if your disk drive has like a one in a million chance of, or you know, say like, one in 10,000, one in 100,000 chance of failing on any given day, 
the chance that both fail on the same day is really super unlikely, right? It's basically going to require, you know, somebody stuffs a grenade into your RAID device, something like that, that might do it. Okay. But, you know, random electronic or magnetic failures at the same time, that's super unlikely. Okay. Now, last one is parity. Parity is weird and complicated. So I'm going to try to keep it simple. Parity means errors can be detected and corrected. There are other schemes that are simpler where you could just notice that an error happens. Like, for example, you could do like a checksum at the end of a block of data and basically do some math on all the data there. And if it's all correct, it adds up to the checksum at the end. But even if it doesn't match the checksum, you don't know exactly where the failure was, okay? With parity, you can find out where the error is. And in some sense, parity, in some sense, always requires three copies. I'm gonna explain why. So, I'm gonna draw my standard uh, vacation picture here. This is a good one. Okay, so let's do it with blue sky. And we're going to put in some beach. Beach. And we're going to add in some sunshine. Okay, so it's the literal opposite of today. And beach. There we go. There's a nice little vacation picture. Okay. So. Suppose I have two copies of this. And suppose that in this one, Second one, the sun appears orange. How am I going to know with just two copies, how am I going to know which is the correct one? You can't, right? You might say, well, maybe the original was orange. Now as humans, we might have more advanced knowledge and be able to figure it out. But if you're dealing with some big automated system that just says, oh, version one looks like this, version two looks like this. I don't know, I don't know what went wrong. Something went wrong, they're not the same, but I don't know whether the original, you know, I don't, I don't know what the original form was. However, if you have three copies and two of them are the same and one of them is different, you can look at that and say, ah, one of these things is not like the other. That's the mistake, right? Because it's vanishingly unlikely that two copies would have the exact same errors in the exact same place at the exact same time. Not mathematically impossible, but like I said, vanishingly unlikely. Okay. So parity in some sense, again, don't have to get super technical. If you want to learn more about it, there's a link in the slides. Basically in a way you create kind of a third copy and the way they do with that is embedding some extra data within each file, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to make a note of that down here. We'll keep it in red. Third copy data embedded in the files. Now the problem with parity, parity is great in the sense for reliability. Parity, great for reliability, right? If something goes wrong, if the file data gets corrupted, you can recover from that. You can actually reconstruct the original file the way it's supposed to be. It doesn't add, right? So I'm gonna say uh, read speed, same. It doesn't affect read speed. Right, because what it's going to do, your file uh, system is just going to grab one copy of it, right? So if you, with mirroring, parity by itself isn't going to affect anything much. With mirroring, so I have to expand this square bit. Even if you have multiple copies, if you're reading a file with mirroring, it's not going to matter. Because why? Because it's just going to pick one copy of the file and read that, okay? But write speed with mirroring, that's not going to be affected really either because, you know, you've got to copy all three files regardless. But where it really affects it, write speed with mirroring and striping, striping just by itself. I'll just say just with striping. Very, very slow because not only, right, because this data is embedded throughout the file, you not only have to do it on like multiple disk drives, because there's different copies there. But with striping, every file itself is broken up across multiple things. So it's not even gonna be sequential. It's gonna be 
a bunch of isolated operations. So if you're making a lot of tiny changes to files, like you have a database file and you occasionally like change a little bit of data here and here and here and here in it, that's gonna be super slow if you provide parity and striping. So when you're designing these kind of RAID systems, you have to consider the pros and cons of all this. You know, how important is uh, reliability? How important is speed? You know, what's the likelihood that we'll get into a situation where these kind of crises are gonna happen as far as system getting overloaded? These are the kind of things Facebook has to deal with because, you know, their big system of many, many hard drives, it's functionally a lot like a very, very large RAID system, right? They create multiple copies of things. They have to implement mechanisms for reliability and recovery. These are the sort of issues they have to deal with too. Okay, questions on any of this? Any of that makes sense, yeah. Something went wrong with the data, the file got, got corrupted. Yeah, we just assumed there's some flaw in the data, something went wrong with the hardware. It could happen in any one of different ways, right? I mean, sometimes things go wrong is all, yeah. I mean, I'm sure we've all occasionally lost files. Like one of the things that could often happen on old timey hard drives is if you lost power, right? If you shut down your device while there was some file operation in progress, mess up uh, the file that you had stored. Uh, you know, if any of us used computers 10 years ago, then yeah, we've seen that. Cool, okay. So, uh, very quick bit about hard drive speed. The reason why I mentioned hard drives is of course, Haystack is a little bit of an older system. They implemented it around 2009, and even though they started using solid state drives shortly afterward, solid state drives are a lot faster, Haystack itself was originally implemented with hard drives. So, but I feel like we, we've talked a, little, a lot about this already. So basically with hard drives, you got a little disc inside the drive housing, right? If you've ever taken out a hard drive or seen one, it looks like a little box, right? It looks like a little box about like that, probably your standard, you know, three and a half inch ones. And uh, there's a disc on the inside or, or multiple discs. And there's what's called a read write head, the thing that the equivalent of a needle and a vinyl record thing that spins around and like finds the right spot to read data. Anyway, the hard drives, they read the data by physically moving the uh, drive head around the platter, right? The platter spins, the drive head can move from side to side to read things at the correct uh, you know, track, but combination of both. But because uh, hard drives are physical, not electrical, not only are they just inherently slower than regular RAM, but it even takes time to move that drive head around to the hard drive, different places in the hard drive. So because of that, sequential operations, like reading data all that's continuous on one track, it's gonna happen a lot faster uh, than reading random data scattered around the drive, but it's still gonna be at physical speeds, no matter how you slice it. Hard drives, you can optimize hard drives to work better, but they're always gonna be a lot slower than RAM. Okay, now, Roughly speaking, hard drives have about 100 times the memory for the same price as RAM. I mean, you could do a price check on these things. Uh, this is what I did, I think, over the summer. You know, a me medium quality one terabyte disk drive, you might pay about 50 bucks for that, right? I mean, obviously there's a range of quality and prices, but 50 bucks or so is a you know, plausible number. On the other hand, I did a price check on eight gigs of RAM, found that to be $40. And so again, you know, one terabyte is about a thousand gigs, thousand gigabytes. So, you know, it's about a hundred times uh, cheaper uh, disk drives are. And of course, you know, you can do like some kind of massive checks. If you want to like look up how much, uh, say an exabyte of RAM would cost, let's do a price check on an exabyte of RAM. Let's just find out. I mean, nobody's going to sell it to you in one chunk. How much for one exabyte of RAM? Thank you. Green. Okay, we're gonna find out. No, these are uh, nobody even talks about it. They're like, nope. Why? Why would you ask? This is crazy. Yeah, I mean, they could sell you a whole bunch of things, right? Bags of yeah. Nobody. Even, it'd be pretty expensive. I could look up one terabyte of RAM and just multiply it uh, by a million. One terabyte of RAM. What? I was looking. Okay, well this is from a few years ago, but they're saying like 18,000 for 1.5 terabytes. So about 10,000 per terabyte of RAM. Now if you say 10,000 per terabyte of RAM, multiply that by a million to get an exabyte, 
right? $10 billion for one exabyte of RAM. And Facebook has many exabytes. So I'm sure they're looking at, would it look at least at like $100 billion just to buy the RAM to store their stuff, to say nothing of, you know, additional operating costs, anything like that. So that's a lot of money even for Facebook, right? Just not really feasible. Maybe they get some, you know, bulk discounts. I'm sure they would, but still, it's a lot of money. All right. Anyway, so hard drives, uh, even solid state drives, much, much slower than the same amount of current generation uh, SD RAM. Okay, so you want a, a good number on that, somewhere between like five and 50 times slower for uh, solid state drives. But it really depends on a lot of factors, not just the hardware itself, but what it's trying to do. Remember, RAM is super fast, but it's also random access. So you can bounce around a lot to different memory locations. Most solid state drives work better with sequential memory. So if your system is dealing a lot with sequential memory, it's gonna look a little bit better versus RAM. If it's not dealing with sequential memory a lot, it's gonna look a lot worse. Anyway, so problem is, if you're trying to do real-time applications, if you want everything to be really fast, the extra delays that would get added on by solid state drives instead of RAM are in a lot of cases are gonna to be too slow. Uh, the other thing, your data systems are already gigantic, right? If you put everything in disk drives instead of RAM, number one, you'd have to have a lot of disks running in parallel to serve your most popular stuff, right? Otherwise there would be a massive backlog because every request for popular stuff would have to be sent out separately. You'd have to read it from the disk drive once, send it to user one, read it again, send it out. I mean, that's still potentially what you do with RAM, but since RAM is so much faster, you don't really notice, right? To deal with that with disk drives, you'd have to have many, many, many copies of disk drives holding the popular data so they could serve it up faster and on top of that, your system would like spend all day navigating what's popular, what isn't, rewriting what's in hard drives, and that would take a lot more time too. So it'd be a whole lot more work. And even with all that work, your system response time would still be slower, right? Even if uh, every uh, request is answered uniquely from one hard drive, it's still gonna be a lot slower than RAM. So you kind of need both. And where you implement those is these kind of hybrid systems. So. One example is this one, there used to be a uh, better picture of it available. Oracle had one called its times 10 system. So I'll take, I'll take a minute to talk about that, talk a minute to talk about uh, grid systems generally, then we'll be done. Thank you, screen, yes. Okay, I know we only got like three minutes, but we're gonna, we're gonna work this out to the end. So you have a bank of RAM, and remember, most popular stuff stays in RAM because you get a lot of requests for it, but you can respond to those requests quickly. But you also need permanent storage. Number one, because it's cheap, but number two, you don't want some intern on their first day tripping over a power cord and shutting off your system, right? And you lose everything. So here, your permanent storage is gonna be disk of some kind. Okay, so when requests come in, the first thing that happens is can you fulfill it by going through RAM, right? If somebody asks for a picture, some part of your system asks for a picture, is it there in RAM? If it is, you respond immediately, send it back. Okay, so I'll draw that. But if it's not in RAM, you know that you have it, so it's gotta be stored in permanent storage, right? And you pull it from there. So that's your, your request cycle. And again, most popular requests served by RAM because RAM is faster, but you can't put everything in RAM because that would be way too expensive. So most of your data, stuff that's not popular, not accessed very often, that's gonna be kept in permanent storage, okay? And every now and then, I'm gonna mention this, that. Ah. Periodic uh, switching around, or I'll just say update of what's in RAM. Because over time, what's popular is going to change, right? Today's popular news becomes to tomorrow's old news, becomes next month's very old news. Stuff isn't going to stay in RAM. There's going to be new, more popular data, more recent data overriding it. So there's this constant, you know, refresh going on. Some stuff that's in RAM is eventually going to be migrated to permanent storage. On the other hand, you know, you could have some uh, data necromancy where you pull stuff out of the dead that hasn't been like looked at in 10 or 20 years. And for whatever reason, something goes viral and you pull it out and you put it in RAM because suddenly it's popular for some reason, right? That stuff can happen. But mostly it works the other way. Mostly popular stuff goes to permanent storage. And I guess we're hitting our time. So I'm gonna close out this. Let's see. 
Oracle system, yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Hybrid system with RAM and hard drives, balance of cost and speed, speed where you need it to keep the costs down, right? And for organizations, most organizations have this uh, phenomenon where most data is historic, rarely looked at. They put popular stuff in a cache where it's easier to get, okay? All right, that's all I got. We'll come back and resume on Tuesday. Have a good weekend. Well, it's always in uh, the recordings. Oh, in the recordings. Everything's in the recordings. Oh, well, here you are. So I, I ended up transferring into finance. Yeah. This is going to be my favorite class. Oh, good. And I'm so happy that you teach it in a way that's like not super boring. Oh, good. Because I just came back from like managerial accounting and I was like pretty much falling asleep in it. Yeah. This is, this is great. I'm glad you're happy. Yeah, I was a uh, recreational program. I used to do assembly and uh, some other stuff back in the 80s, but and then C++ through the 90s. But I wasn't a computer science guy. I just did it for fun. Yeah, but I was a finance undergrad too, so it's weird. And then I rolled.